Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Has everyone made it to the right chat? This is session two. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. My name is Eva Kinnebrew. I'm the moderator for today's session. Um, I will be introducing the presenters and also keeping track of time. So again, um, the speakers have 12 minutes to present and then there's three minutes for questions. Presenters, please um, view the chat while you're speaking because I will give you a five minute warning and a two minute warning. And then if you go 30 seconds over time, I will unmute myself and interrupt you and you don't want that to happen. Um, so please try your best to stay within your time range. Um, again, if you have questions, try to hold on to them until the speaker is done. Um, you can either post your question in the chat and I will speak it out loud, or you can raise your hand with a little hand raiser icon and in teams or you could say like question in the chat and then you can say your question out loud just a reminder this session is being recorded all right so let's get started first we have maya fine cole uh, she grew up in lexington massachusetts and this winter she is looking forward to having some time off and climbing at the gym the title of her talk is spatial modeling of resource uh, recovery and reuse uh, using Sri Lankan oops, compost systems as an example. All right, Maya, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Eva said, I'm Maya. Thank you all for tuning in today. It's really nice to see some people instead of just being alone. Um, my, my research is called Spatial Modeling of Resource Recovery and Reuse Using Sri Lankan Compost Systems as an Example. I've been working on this project for the past two years. I started working on this during my sophomore year of undergrad as a lab assistant, and I'm currently a senior, and this project has morphed into my research for um, the accelerated 4 plus 1 master's program that I'm in. Next slide, please. So our current system of nutrient use is linear. Food production relies, on, relies increasingly on chemical fertilizers that contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to sustain crop yields. The production of these fertilizers relies heavily on non-renewable resources and is energy intensive. If not recovered, <laughs> sorry, if not recovered, these nutrients will end up in waterways and cause pollution, algal blooms, and eutrophication, something that I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with living near Lake Champlain. Because of this, there is a push to shift from a linear economy to a circular economy. However, there is little information on how to sustainably apply nutrient cycling and waste management technologies. Some previous research has indicated that it's important to analyze the co-location of nutrient sources and potential areas of nutrient demand to maximize the efficiency of nutrient recovery and reuse. And this can best be done by spatial modeling. There have been several nutrient cycling models that have been created. However, these models tend to be specific to the scenarios they were created for and cannot easily be applied to other landscapes. And that brings us to the goal of this project, which is to develop a material recovery and reuse spatial model in ArcGIS that can be applied to any landscape and any question. The tool will simulate the optimal distribution of a recovered resource by minimizing the travel distance to agricultural areas where that resource can be reused to support soil fertility. The model will be tested on Sri Lankan composting systems but the final model will be applicable to many scenarios and will be open source, free, and accessible. Next slide. Thanks. And so for some background on why this project is based in Sri Lanka, in 2008, a devastating dump collapse due to the buildup of organic matter led to the creation of Sri Lanka's Pilisaru project. The project required the separation of organic matter from municipal solid waste streams and established a national network of compost facilities that collect organic waste from households, restaurants, and other businesses. This nationwide composting network is the first of its kind in the world, and it has been effective in reducing organic waste input to landfills. However, the current market demand for compost is less than the amount produced. Tools are needed that inform strategies to improve the flow of compost to the agricultural sector. Sri Lanka is a really great place to test this resource recovery and reuse model due to its existing infrastructure around composting. 
However, for this tool to actually be useful in informing policy decisions in Sri Lanka, an on-the-ground understanding of their compost system is key to determine assumptions of the spatial model that I'll be making. Next slide. So this diagram outlines the composting methods used as well as the key ways compost is returned to the market. Compost is produced from organic municipal solid waste using the windrow method where compost sits in large piles and is turned a few times before being sieved. This diagram indicates the importance of on-site marketing for compost sales as a way to return nutrients and compost to the food system. This leads us to the question, who is buying the compost and what kinds of markets is it being used in? Next slide, please. So over the past couple of years, my advisor, Dr. Roy, has interviewed 20 composting facility managers and has asked them which industries are buying their product. His interviews found that the largest producers of compost, the largest purchasers of compost are households as tea and tea, as you can see in the chart on the left. And that most facilities sell compost to two user types, but some sell them to many more up to six, as seen in the graph on the right. This information of current compost demand influenced the development of the model and how it specifically could be applied to this Sri Lankan compost system. Next slide. And that brings us to the specific methods of this model. Based on all this background, I've developed a methodology for how this model will work. The model will accept two raster inputs, a source layer and a potential application layer or demand layer. The model first identifies the smallest source location. This was decided under the assumption that the smallest compost facilities would have the fewest resources to distribute their compost. The demand closest to the source location is met first and then the model will continue distributing nutrients in this optimal pattern until the source is depleted. This process continues until supply from all source locations have been redistributed. The model will produce maps showing the spatial distribution of reused nutrients under various scenarios. Next slide. So this slide shows an example of what a distribution pattern could look like on a really small and simplified scale. Um, We've selected a spatial grid approach to simplify modeling and also to allow us to work with really large data sets. So the source cell in these is shown in orange and the demand cells or potential application cells are shown in green. You can see how the model distributes resource to the closest locations first and then slowly moves away in a cyclical pattern until the supply cell is completely depleted. The final grid on the far right shows where the source material has been distributed. Next slide. So I've developed a preliminary model um, using the model builder function in ArcGIS Pro. Um, the model has been tested on the Sri Lankan system under one scenario. And under the scenario, I made the following assumptions. First, I assume that 20% of organic waste is turned into compost which is an estimate that has aligned with what facility owners have said. And we also assume that 10 metric tons of compost per hectare of cropland is required annually. And the biggest assumption we made was that all the nearest farmers accepted the compost or, or used the compost. Um, and yeah, from these preliminary results, you can see that this, the distribution of compost uh, is pretty much only right around where the pixel is like it didn't spread out very far from the compost facilities and the reason for that is because i used a, a base map with a five kilometer spatial scale which might have been a little bit too big and that's why it was a loose model so in the future i will be testing a couple different scenarios um especially with big with smaller pixel sizes so these preliminary results show that the model functions properly and it also provides insight into potential applications of the tool. Um, however, some adjustments will need to be made. Like I mentioned, a big one is the pixel size and another one will be how much, how many farmers are accepting the compost. These preliminary results have also given some insight into the factors we want to adjust for. Um, next slide. And that brings us to conclusions and next steps. My, my biggest next step is to improve the model iteration, so how it repeats, and reduce the model runtime. 
Right now it's kind of big and clunky and takes a really long time to run. So I want it to actually be usable. And to do that, it needs to be more efficient. And the biggest way I'm going to be doing that is by minimizing um, necessary calculations just to improve efficiency and also investigating other modeling options, especially Python and using Python um, uh, together with Arc. And then after I have improve the model, I will be running it on multiple realistic Sri Lanka scenarios, and I'm going to be adjusting for three factors. The first factor is I'm going to be setting a distance threshold, which is the maximum distance that compost will travel from the supply to the demand site. If nutrients have to travel really far to be reapplied to croplands, like the value of this whole study is not very, it's pretty diminished. Um, the second thing I'll be adjusting for is farmer application rate. Basically, the percentage of the percentage of farmers within like a certain area that actually accept the compost. So my previous assumption was that all of them did, um, and that's just not realistic. So I'm gonna have to do some research and go through those interviews and see what proportion of farmers will actually accept the compost. Um, and then the last thing I'll be adjusting for is nutrient demand by crop type. Right now, the model was run on a general cropland layer, so it just showed whether land was being used for farming or not. Um, and I assume that all crops had the same nutrient requirements, which is just not the case in real life. So I'm going to be using a map that shows different what the different crops are that are actually be growing, be that are being grown on this farmland, um, and. I will see if spatial distribution is altered by varying nutrient requirements of different crops um, that are grown around the country. So to conclude, the model can be applied to inform marketing and distribution practices to ensure nutrients in composted waste are reused in Sri Lanka. Moving beyond the country, the model could be applied to other landscapes to answer similar resource distribution questions. It doesn't just have to be specific to compost. It can be applied to any anything that has a point source that can be distributed to other places. Um, the results of this model can inform policymakers on the most efficient allocations of funds and resources, leading towards a more efficient and sustainable circular economy. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Maya. All right, does anyone have any questions? Um, I guess I I can go. So you said the go the primary <laughs> uh, purchaser or the primary people interested in are actually the households, and so is that um, small farming? Like what what uh, would households themselves primarily be be using the compost for? Yeah, a lot of a a lot of it's it's kind of interesting. Um, a lot of households will just have like these like big gardens where they grow a lot of food and it's like actually its own like land use type on some land use maps it's just like home gardens um and it's just like a different like cultural thing like that's just what they do there so actually a lot of people a lot of like homeowners just people that have their own gardens at home would be interested in some compost nice so does that get taken account because i know you were talking about the crop or like the farmland yeah in terms of the de demand <laughs> it's not taken account to in the in what i the like preliminary modeling i did because it's not included in farmland however it is included in like just like that general land use layer that i was talking about that specifies different crops um but the one thing about home gardens is that it's just really hard to estimate it's just hard to estimate like how many people would be buying that and like what the nutrient requirements of stuff like that is. So it does make it a little tricky, but ideally that would be included since it's such a big part of who's actually using the compost. Awesome. So we are at 515. Thanks again, Maya. If anyone else has questions for Maya, you can contact her, I assume. I'm sure she'd be happy to take your questions. 
again, this is session two. If um, if you want to switch to session one, there's the QR code and there's also a link there. But we'll just go ahead and start with our next speaker, um, who is Hanusha Higgins. So Hanusha grew up in central Pennsylvania and this winter she's looking forward to eating lots of soup. Today her talk is entitled Impacts of Emerald Ash Borer Management on Northern Hardwood Forest Dynamics in New England. Take it away, Hanusha. Thank you, Eva. Next slide. So invasive pests are a major issue in U.S. forests, especially in the Northeast. As you can see from this map, we have dozens of species attacking our forests. And because our North American species aren't often as well adapted to deal with these pests, they can be much more destructive than native ones. This map uses data from 2012, so there are even more pests these days, such as the spotted lantern fly, which was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Next. One of the most devastating invasive pests in North America is the emerald ash borer, or EAB. It's a glittery green beetle, and it's originally from Eastern Asia. It was first discovered stateside in Michigan in 2002, although we now believe that it's been here since the 1990s. It attacks ash trees, and all North American ash species, unfortunately, are susceptible to EAB to varying degrees. Next. EAB kills trees by feeding on their phloem layer, which transports nutrients throughout the tree. This feeding basically cuts off the tree's nutrient transport system, and they can die within a few years once infested. So on the left, you can see an example of the feeding tunnels that EAB creates, which are quite extensive. And on the right, you can see how this pest not only affects ash trees in forests, but also those in urban and suburban environments. So this street in Toledo, Ohio, was decimated by EAB in only a few short years. Um, the beautiful ash trees there provided shade and oxygen to the residents, and three years later, they were completely killed. Next. So as you might have guessed from the title of my talk, EAB isn't just in the Midwest. It's now spread to over 35 U.S. states and five Canadian provinces, um, and those states are represented on this map by the green or blue overlay. Um, I do have to mention one reason it's been able to spread so quickly is that humans disperse it by moving firewood that's infested with EAB. Um, as my advisor likes to say, EAB can travel as fast as 65 miles an hour down the highway in the back of a truck. So if you take away nothing else from my talk today, please just remember to not move firewood long distances. Next. So why should we care about this pest and what it's doing to our ashes? There are a lot of reasons to care about it. So ecologically, we're not just losing ash trees. There are also ripple effects throughout the ecosystem. One study in Michigan found that the forests hit hard by EAB had more invasive plants colonizing the areas where ash trees had been. And economically, it's pretty expensive to treat and or remove so many trees, especially in more populated areas. One study in 2010 estimated those costs would exceed $10 billion. And the area EAB has invaded is now larger than that study projected. And black ash in particular is a very important cultural resource to several indigenous tribes, including the Abenaki tribe here in Vermont, who use black ash wood for their traditional basket making craft. And unfortunately, black ash is one of the species hit the hardest by EAB. So there's a lot motivating people to save our ashes. Next. So we've taken several approaches to managing EAB and mitigating its impacts. One of those is chemical treatment, which involves injecting ash trees with an insecticide that kills the EAB feeding on it. This is effective, but it is costly and it's temporary because it only lasts for a few years at a time. And it's a tree by tree solution, it's not a landscape level solution. Biological control involves introducing EAB parasitoids from its native range to control its population here, since it's lacking in natural enemies in the US. Several parasitoids have been successfully released in the US, but at this point they haven't been able to get EAB in check to the point where it's a tolerable and non-fatal pest to most ash trees. Genetic programs are breeding EAB resistance in ash trees and making progress, but that's more of a long-term solution and it's not going to save the ash in our forests and towns and cities right now. However, I want to highlight that there is some level of natural resistance to EAB among the North American ash species. Most of them die, but not all of them do, and that's important. Next. So I will be focusing on forest management techniques, which encompass a wide range of strategies. Um, one strategy that was implemented for a while and promoted was the phloem reduction technique of cutting down the largest ash trees because they have the most real estate for EAB. Uh, but that didn't end up really reducing EAV populations, it more just reduced ash populations. 
And more recently, there's been more effort to promote ash regeneration since the future of ash in North America isn't quite as dire as we once thought it was. Some individuals, which are called lingering ash, have been able to resist death by EAB for longer periods of time. And if we cut down all the ash before giving those lingering ash a chance to survive, we're losing the genetic diversity that may hold the key to EAB resistant ash in North America. Next. One point to keep in mind is that management of a forest pest can have a larger impact on the forest than the pest itself, or even just a different kind of impact. Next. So what do we know about this issue? We know about the direct impacts of EAB on ash trees and the communities they live in. We know about the impacts of management for other invasive pests, such as the hemlock woolly adelgid, which has some similarities to EAB. And several studies have predicted the effects of management for EAB on our forests using surveys and models. But what we don't yet know is um, what management strategies are actually happening, what's already in place in our forests, and what impacts are those practices having? And that's the question that I'm trying to answer. Next. So the goals of my study are first to quantify the effects of management practices, which are intended to mitigate EAB impacts on New England forests. Then I'll use those data to create ecosystem models of forest development following EAB invasion and associated management practices. And then I'll use those models to develop a decision support tool to assist stakeholders in managing their forests for the future of ash trees and more broadly for the communities in which they grow. Next. This summer, I sampled northern hardwood and rich northern hardwood forests throughout New England, which contain a relatively small but significant component of primarily white ash. Some of those forests had been harvested in response to or in anticipation of EAB, and others had not recently been harvested. EAB was confirmed to be some of these forests or nearby, and others it hadn't reached yet. So those are the kind of factors that I was considering. Next. So within those forests, we use 10th acre sample plots to capture multiple levels of forest structure and composition from overstory to understory, as well as deadwood, and of course, capturing what was cut in harvested areas. And we also assessed the health of any ash tree over an inch in diameter to monitor the actual EAB impact. Next. Okay, with a lot of assistance from various people and agencies, we were able to sample forests across New England, in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And there was a range of land ownership represented, including state, federal, and private lands. And about half of these sites had been harvested recently with EAB in mind, and the other half had not. Next. While out in the field, we found a variety of situations from some not so healthy ash, which you can see on the left, to some pretty healthy ash, which you can see on the right. And that was always nice to see. Um, but in the harvested sites, we saw a pretty large variety in the treatments that had been applied for EAB management. Next. So these treatments vary, range in intensity from removing just a few trees to removing virtually all the ash trees plus other species, since EAB management was usually not the only factor motivating these harvests. And the type of harvest seemed to correlate with the motivation for that harvest, whether it's for ecological reasons, um, like promoting future ash regeneration, or conversely, managing the forest to transition away from ash. Uh, for economic reasons, since white ash is a highly valuable wood and it's much more challenging to harvest after it's been killed by EAB, so a lot of these are preemptive harvests, and for safety reasons because dead ash trees falling into roads and on cars is pretty undesirable. Next. As you might imagine, there's a lot of data to sort through from this summer, and I've really just started analyzing it and taking a first look at what's happening in terms of harvesting. So up top, you can see the basal area of cut ash trees within harvested plots, and below is the proportion of basal area harvested in each plot. So you can see that spread from just a bit of the ash in a plot that was harvested to all of it. Next. This is something that you'd expect and the data confirms it. Uh, the basal area of the ash left standing and alive in the harvested plots was significantly lower than in the unharvested plots. So these management practices are significantly reducing the amount of mature ash in these forests and I'll be extending this analysis to look at other overstory species as well. Next. And just looking at one more variable for now, which is the number of seedlings per square meter, because that regeneration represents the future of these forests. I plotted that here against the proportion of ash harvested, which I used as kind of a proxy for overall harvest intensity. And again, this is very preliminary, but a couple trends you can see here are sugar maple seedlings decreasing and red maple and American beech seedlings increasing with increased harvest intensity. This is just the start of analyzing these data, and I'll continue to do so in the coming months. Next. 
In addition, I will be using these data with the forest landscape model Landis 2 to simulate these various ash management regimes and how they might interact with various climate regimes in four counties, so Orleans and Caledonia counties in northeastern Vermont, as well as Bennington County, Vermont, and Berkshire County, Massachusetts, further south. Um, and I'll be translating these results into an accessible decision support tool to help foresters and landowners and land managers understand the impacts of their management decisions on ash and on the larger forest landscape that ash exists in and to help inform their decisions moving forward. Next. So these are my references. Next. And these are the people I'd like to thank, especially my advisor, Tony D'Amato, Nate Siegert, uh, my committee, Jen Pontius and Yolanda Chen, all of the amazing field technicians who helped me collect data over the summer. And as you can imagine, you know, doing field work in a pandemic is a bit challenging. So there were so many people who helped make that possible at various agencies and even private landowners who are willing to let me come around and measure some trees. Um, so all of those people who helped out this summer, I'm so grateful to them and I'm grateful to all of you for your time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Hanusha. Does anyone have any questions? Again, you can put them in the chat um, or you can unmute yourself or use the little hand icon. Hi, Anusha. Great presentation. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really curious about that regeneration you're seeing and wondering if you think that there's enough ash recruitment to kind of, you know, further along the forest in the future, or if you think that there would be some, some more management to help out with that regeneration. Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know what I would necessarily call like enough ash regeneration for further future recruitment, but there are definitely um, things that people can be doing that they're in a lot of cases not doing at this point. So one that's really important and uh, kind of a lesser known fact is that um, ash trees can, are either male or female, they're dioecious. So you need both male and female ash trees close enough together to get regeneration. And they actually, the male trees outnumber the female trees about seven to one. So making sure that you keep some female trees, even if you're cutting most of your ash is really important for regeneration. So that's a big strategy to kind of uh, prioritize. Great, thanks. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left. Um, hi, I had a question about um, like what you would recommend for forest regeneration in Rocky Mountain National Forest, um, as they're seeing a lot of invasive species and that's having a severe impact on the forest quality. Yeah, so Rocky Mountain National Forest, that's in Colorado, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, and what types of trees are out there? I'm not as familiar with that, with the West. Um, mostly uh, white pine trees. Okay, um, honestly, I don't know if I can speak to that as much. Um, so I don't wanna give you any false information, but I bet that the US Forest Service has some resources on that or potentially like the local um, forest agencies. So I'm not as familiar with the pests out West, but I'm sure there is work being done on them uh, to promote regeneration and forest health. Thank you so much. Um, do you know anything about like indigenous use of um, fire to like tame like uh, pests in forests? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know much. So again, I don't wanna like speak on something that I'm not very familiar with. As far as I know, fire is used more for, it's definitely a tool that's been used in silviculture in North America for a long time. And it's kind of experiencing a little bit of a renaissance now with more um, practitioners implementing that. But as far as I know, it's not something that's usually used for forest pests because insects are you know, pretty resilient and often invasions are started by just one or a few insects coming to an area. So fire is probably not something that's going to uh, be used to control pests as much as it is, as it is used to um, achieve other forest management goals. But again, I'm not totally sure on that. Awesome, thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and switch to our next presenter, though I first wanna remind everyone that we're in session two. If you wanna go to session one, um, follow that link.
again, a reminder that this um, symposium is being recorded. All right, so next we have Elizabeth Jameson, or EJ. She grew up in Synecdoche, New York, and she is looking for she is looking forward uh, this winter to cross country skiing. Her title, the title of her talk, is adaptation strategies for reducing susceptibility of northeastern pitch pine barrens to southern pine beetle impacts. Thanks, EJ. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide. For a quick overview, I'm just going to start by giving you a bit of background information about the pitch pine barrens and southern pine beetle, and then I'll move into my objectives, my methods, and I'll finish by showing some of the results I've gathered so far. So next slide, please. So uh, welcome to the northeastern pitch pine barrens. Um, this is a globally rare ecosystem characterized by sandy nutrient poor soils and open stand conditions dominated by pitch pine. Um, it's highly heterogeneous with many different community types occurring across its extent. And by now I've spent a lot of time in the pine barrens, yet I'm constantly astounded by its beauty and uniqueness. And compared to northern hardwoods we have in the northeast, it truly feels like a completely different world sometimes. Uh, and this world provides unique habitat for rare and endangered wildlife species too. Next slide. So here are just some of these amazing species that I've been fortunate enough to come across in my study sites. In the upper left, we have the blue corner butterfly. Bottom left is the um, eastern whippoorwill chicks. And then on the right there, we have an eastern box turtle. And so for many of these pine barrens, um, low to moderate surface fires have historically been important in maintaining their unique stand structure and this habitat. And many of those fires uh, were set by native peoples. In recent decades, however, um, fire suppression and land development have resulted in the loss of approximately half um, of our historically known pine barrens. And so many of these barrens now require active management um, to prevent conversion to a closed canopy hardwood dominated system. And so if those threats weren't enough, uh, in 2014, a new one emerged in the form of southern pine beetle. Next slide. Southern pine beetle is a bark boring beetle. It infests pine trees and lays eggs under the bark. And as the larvae develop, they feed on the phloem and they eventually kill the tree before emerging as adults and dispersing to new host trees. Next slide. This damage, uh, this slide shows some damage caused by southern pine beetle. Uh, you can see those uh, pine needles turning brown and reddening before they will eventually fall and the tree will die. And during outbreak conditions, southern pine beetle can cause host death in as little as two to four months, which is really fast for a pest. Um, and that leads to massive timber losses, sometimes exceeded billions of dollars in just a few years. Uh, next slide. And this is a map of that damage, and you can see most of it is concentrated in the southeastern United States, um, where it is in its native range. But um, the recently, in recent decades, the um, beetle has hopped up into the northeast there, and you can see a lot of damage occurring in New Jersey, Long Island, and Connecticut. And because of this pest's aggression, we are highly concerned about its spread in these northern pine forests that evolved without this beetle present on the landscape. Next slide. And zooming into these forests, here's a map that shows the different pine dominated forests of the Northeast. And these include jack pine, red pine, and pitch pine forests. And those black lines show the year at which the climate is expected to be suitable for Southern pine beetle. And by 2050, 78% of pitch pine forests are expected to be suitable. So these pine barrens, these globally rare ecosystems are really on the frontier of this invasion. And unfortunately, it's already there. Next slide. This map shows the um, results of southern pine beetle detection traps with those blue triangles indicating negative traps and the red dots indicating positive traps. And I decided to focus my research on those areas highlighted in yellow there. Um, the Long Island Pine Barrens, where there have been many serious outbreaks. The Albany Pine Bush, which hasn't seen any serious outbreaks. And then also in the um, Ossipee Pine Barrens, which have not seen any outbreaks either. Next slide. So the goal of my research is to develop tools for the identification of pitch pine barrens that are at the greatest risk for southern pine beetle damage. And these stands could then be prioritized for prevention management. Specifically, first, I'm going to be assessing the stand conditions within the pine barrens, and then I'll be using this information to develop a hazard rating model that will predict stand level susceptibility to the beetle. 
Lastly, I'm compiling all of that information into a management guide for pitch pine barrens in relation to southern pine beetle. And so how am I going about this? Next slide. And next slide. Uh, so my 2019 field season took place on Long Island, where we were sampling infested and uninfested pitch pine barrens. And for all the trees within our plots, we recorded metrics such as species, diameter, and infestation stage. And so by com com comparing um, conditions present in those infested stands to uninfested stands, I can figure out what conditions make some stands more susceptible to the beetle. And so that's the information that will be used to develop this hazard rating model. Next slide. And my 2020 field season, um, I new, moved northward into some healthy pine barrens, um, the Albany pine bush and the Ospie pine barrens. And these healthy barrens will be evaluated using this hazard rating model. And that will hopefully help land managers decide how they can most effectively use the resources to prevent southern pine beetle from establishing in their forests. And so how am I looking at this data? Next slide. And next slide. So there are many forestry metrics that go into assessing a stand, but for our purposes today, we're just gonna focus on stand density. Uh, next slide. And that's because stand density has a large effect on insect impact, which is what this figure is showing. So as stand density increases, trees are packed closer together, which means they're more stressed and therefore more vulnerable to insects. So in general, the less dense stands are less susceptible to the pest, um, while more dense stands are more susceptible to pest damage. Next slide. And there are many different things that impact stand density, um, but let's look at uh, take a look at three. The geographic region, the community type, and the management strategy. Next slide. So first, let's look at region. Um, here's a box plot that is showing stand density expressed as uh, basal area on the y-axis, and then the different regions I've sampled on the x-axis. And basal area is essentially just a measure of how much of the space in a stand is taken up by trees. Um, and so these letters over the box there, they show the level of statistical significance between these regions. So you can see that the Albany pine bush is significantly less dense than the Long Island pine barrens. Um, that means that in general, the Long Island pine barrens are more dense and may be more susceptible to southern pine beetle than these other barrens. And that type of information um, is really useful in understanding the range of conditions present across the landscape, uh, but forest management operates at a much finer scale. Uh, so for the next results, uh, let's zoom in and take a look at stand density a bit more closely. Next slide. So another factor that impacts stand density is the assemblage and structure of plants uh, or the community type in a stand. And so here are four pictures of four different community types, and I took all of these in the Albany pine bush this summer, and I arranged them in order of increasing tree density. Uh, so let's start with the pitch pine scrub oak barrens in the upper left. Um, and you can see the scrub oak there with those broad leaves, and this is largely dominated by shrubby understory, which pits with pitch pine um, individuals scattered across. Uh, then we'll move over into the successional northern sand plains grasslands. These communities are made up of beautiful rolling grasslands with pockets of pitch pine growing throughout. And you can see one of those pockets on the right of that picture. Next up is the pitch pine scrub oak barren, which is generally the classic example of pine barrens. You can see the landscape is still very open, but there is a relatively contiguous presence of pitch pine. And lastly, we come to the pitch pine oak forest. That's the most dense community type and canopies can become closed, um, as is the successional trend of many of these barrens, um, if disturbance doesn't keep those open conditions. Next slide. So here's a box plot showing those results. Again, we have the four community types on the X there. And so what does this mean for southern pine beetle? Uh, it means that the pitch pine scrub oak barrens and those pitch pine oak forests may be more susceptible to southern pine beetle. Therefore, it may, might make more sense for land managers to prioritize these stands for um, prevention management. And so um, let's talk about uh, management as one of the last things that can impact the stand density. Next slide. Uh, so common management pine barrens are prescribed burning and thinning. Uh, and these photos on the left are from the Albany pine bush. They were taken during their 2018 prescribed burning efforts. Um, and in many of these communities, um, burning is really important to keep those open stand conditions and to promote regeneration of desired plant species. Uh, and then on the right there, you can see a picture I took in the Ospie pine barrens, and that is of a pitch pine that had been cut before the site was burned. And so thinning is another way that we can manage stands, and it is often used in combination with burning. 
and you can see an adorable little stem sprout coming back from that pitch pine. Next slide. And so uh, here's another box plot that shows density by uh, management strategy. So we have burning and thinning, just burning, just thinning, and then no management. And as expected, um, burned and thinned stands and just burned stands had lower densities than stands that were not managed. Um, so having a deep understanding of the way in which our management strategies affect stand structure is super, super important, especially because in forestry, it can take many years for the full effects of management to be realized. So once we know this type of information, land managers can develop a management plan with the goal to achieve a desired stand structure. Um, in relation to southern pine beetle, land managers could use burning and thinning to both reduce a stand's density and a stand's susceptibility to southern pine beetle. Next slide. And so that brings me to the last part of my thesis, which is applying my research. I will be incorporating all of this information into a management guide that will hopefully help land managers to develop plans that help um, make pine barrens more resistant and resilient to southern pine beetle. And I'll be distributing this directly to landowners and land managers, and we'll also make it publicly available um, so anybody interested can have access. Next slide. So through this research and this management guide, um, my hope is that my thesis will help to stop the range expansion of southern pine beetle and to preserve these unique, diverse and beautiful ecosystems that I feel so fortunate to study. Next slide. And speaking of gratitude, um, so many thanks to so many people. Um, big thanks to Tony for being an incredible advisor, uh, to Kevin for all of his knowledge about the system and being a project partner to Sophie, Edward, and Tessa for being fantastic and fun field techs, um, to Jess and Hanusha for being just miscellaneous research help, uh, and to the rest of these people for providing data and information on how I can make this project as useful as possible. And uh, lastly, thanks to you all um, for taking the time to hear me speak about my work. I hope you learned something or at least got excited to check out some Pine Barrens. So thank you. Thanks so much, EJ. I love all the photos in that. So we have a question from Bill. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, great. So um, Elizabeth, that was a great presentation and I'm just super intrigued and interested in your work and obviously so important and so timely. I just have um, one technical question and it it has to do with your use of the term density and your figures that showed basal area. So um, I guess my my question is that Basal area, of course, is a measure of the of the total cross sectional area of tree stems in a stand. So it's, it's actually more comparable to something like volume or growing space occupancy, where whereas density is a measure of basically the number of trees. And you know sometimes you can have really high basal areas with a fairly low density of trees if the if the trees are large. So I'm wondering if you would see the same kind of relationships if you plotted the you know what some of those things against I don't know average stand diameter quadratic mean diameter or or a, a more direct measure of density itself like stem density so I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit on your your choice of structural metrics yeah for sure so those are all different metrics that I am incorporating into the model and looking at um, I use basal area because that has been shown to be a pretty strong predictor of southern pine beetle activity just because they're using that phloem a lot of the time um, so yeah I'm looking at also trees per hectare um, and assessing it that way and we're also seeing pretty similar uh, results um, pretty similar trends with increasing um, density via trees per hectare um, and then as to the other things you spoke about also looking at the proportion of trees that have um, diameters greater than 40 centimeters um, and looking mm. at how that is impacting the southern pine beetle activity. So yeah, I decided to look um, you know, at density in terms of basal area uh, just for this presentation as like a relatively communicable, communicable uh, way of talking about density. But yeah, those are great points and I'm definitely thinking about those with my research. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, for example, whether like a lower density stand but with bigger, larger trees might actually have greater resistance to the to the pine beetle. Anyway, thanks very much. Oh, of course. Thank you. Any other quick questions? We have about a minute.
All right, if there's no other questions, I'll remind everyone again that uh, you can access session one by following that link. Oh, now it's 545. All right, so let's move on. Thank you, EJ, again. Thank Our you. next presenter is Liam Farley. Liam grew up in Arlington, Vermont, and he is looking forward, looking forward to lots of snow this winter. <laughs> Uh, his talk today is entitled Determining the Effects of Silver Fly Predation on Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Liam. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Eva. Um, yeah, so like Eva says, my name is Liam Farley, and I'm going to be talking to you guys uh, tonight about my research with Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and two species of silver fly from the Pacific Northwest uh, that have potential as a biological control of Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight, I'm going to start out with a little bit of the biology of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, I know some people might already know what hemlock woolly adelgid is, but some people might not. So just want to get everybody on the same page. And then I'll go into why we should care about hemlock trees and their importance. Um, hopefully that's not a tough sell with this crowd. Uh, and then I'll go into briefly about some previous biological control candidates, um, what I mean by biological control, and my research around these two species of solar fly Lacobus argenticolis and Lacobus pinniperta. Next slide. Okay, so what is hemlock woolly adelgid? Hemlock woolly adelgid is a non-native invasive insect that is really, really small. So if you look at the upper right hand picture, there's a red arrow, it's pointing to a little black dot on a, a hemlock twig. And that little black dot is the, ad, the actual uh, adult hemlock woolly adelgid. So they're very, very small insects. Um, but most commonly, what if you were to look up what hemlock woolly adelgid is, you find an image uh, close to the image on the lower right hand, where you have a hemlock branch where there's lots of little white cotton balls kind of clustered together along a twig. Um, each one of those cotton balls contains an adult adelgid and its eggs, and that's referred to as the ovisax. Um, and that's most likely what um, how you would identify hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, so how can such a small little insect uh, kill large trees or even small trees like hemlocks has to do uh, a little bit with their life cycle. So in Eastern North America, hemlock woolly adelgid reproduces asexually. It only has um, asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction, and it consists of two generations a year. So it has a systems generation, which starts in the middle of summer and goes to uh, the spring. And then from the spring to the middle of summer is the progridians generation, also called the summer generation. So with having two generations in asexual reproduction uh, in a single year, hemlock woolly adelgid can uh, exponentially ramp up its populations uh, to quickly infest an entire tree um, and cause decline in mortality of hemlock trees within two to 12 years. And this depends on site and that region's uh, climate. Next slide. So where's hemlock woolly adelgid from? So this is a map showing all the different species of hemlock trees from around the world. Um, and through DNA analysis, uh, they found that the hemlock woolly adelgid, the version of hemlock woolly adelgid that we have in Eastern North America is from Southern Japan. And it's believed to been brought here by, with nursery stock around 1950 um, into uh, the area of Virginia. Next slide. So going into where it's located now, uh, this is the current range as of 2019. All the dark red is the all the counties with hemlock woolly adelgid infestations, and the light green is showing uh, the actual native range of eastern hemlock. So you can see it's covered uh, just over half the native range of eastern hemlock. So not not great. Um, next slide. Okay, so now we know a little bit about what hemlock woolly adelgid is, where it's from, um, where it's currently killing hemlock trees. Um, why should we care? Uh, so hemlock trees are considered uh, a foundation species, meaning they provide uh, the structure for a certain type of ecosystem that many different species rely on. So that includes uh, hemlock forests provided cause really deep shade and they control the understory vegetation and what can grow there. Um, but also that deep shade also 
controls the temperature. So it provides uh, stable temperatures day to day and throughout the year when compared to a deciduous forest. And this is especially important in riparian areas where hemlock forests are present because they have a lower evapotranspiration rate uh, than deciduous forests. So that provides stable stream flows. And it also provides cooler temperature, water temperatures for these streams. So many different aquatic species rely on that kind of ecosystem, uh, species like the brook trout. Um, and in, also in these forests, there's many different species of birds that uh, use hemlock forests, some exclusively use hemlock forests. And it's not just an environmental issue. Uh, studies have shown that um, it's an economic issue as well with uh, hemlock woolly adelgid killing uh, hemlock trees can cause decreases in property values. Next slide. Okay, so going into talking about a little bit about uh, some of the previous biological control candidates and some of the present uh, ones that are still are being assessed as a biological control. Um, and first, I'll just kind of define what I talk what I mean by biological control is what I mean by is um, looking for a natural enemy of hemlock woolly adelgid in its native range or in another area where there's hemlock woolly adelgid like the Pacific Northwest and finding this natural enemy and bringing it to where hemlock woolly adelgid has uh, invaded and using it to control the populations, control them by uh, bringing the popu populations down to a low enough level where they're not causing tree decline or mortality anymore, but they're still going to be on the landscape because they need to be provide food for the biological control that you've introduced. And that way it keeps the biological control on the landscape so that if hemlock woolly adelgid then starts to go back up in population, uh, the biological control is still there to then uh, track that and bring it back down. Uh, okay, so on the left side of the screen, uh, there's a couple of beetle species there from Asia um, that it, were researched and released for uh, controlling hemlock woolly adelgid. And they either uh, failed, uh, they weren't effective in controlling hemlock woolly adelgid, or uh, they could not survive in the climate in uh, Eastern North America. And then on the right, there's a couple of beetles that have been released um, and have established and are present on the landscape in the eastern United States, but um, they're only predators of the winter generation, uh, the assistance generation of hemlock woolly adelgid. And it's starting to look like uh, through research that being a predator of only the winter generation is not going to be enough to actually control the populations of hemlock woolly adelgid. Next slide. So going into what my research revolves around are these two species of solar fly, Lacopus artenticolis and Lacopus pinniperta. And these two species of solar fly have a high potential as a biological control of hemlock woolly adelgid because uh, they are specialist predators of both generations, uh, the cystins and the progridians, so not just one generation. They're also found uh, abundantly with hemlock woolly adelgid in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, research has found that they can survive in the climates uh, the climate of the southern and northern uh, ranges of the infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid in the eastern United States. Um, next slide. So there's a lot that's been researched about uh, these two Lacopus species, but there's still a lot of unknowns. Uh, some of those unknowns are what kind of impacts uh, these two solar flies have on the populations of hemlock woolly adelgid. Like I was saying earlier, some of those beetle species showed high potential, but they didn't end up controlling the populations because they just didn't eat enough hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, another aspect is the phenology of these two solar flies in the Pacific Northwest. So does that match up when uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is in the adult and egg stage, which they primarily like to eat on the East Coast? And then also how many generations uh, these two silver fly species have their fecundity. Uh, it's thought that they have two generations a year, but that is uh, still unknown. Next slide. So going into one of my research objectives, uh, I'll be looking at um, what the effect of these two species of silver fly have on populations of hemlock woolly adelgid. So, um, using two locations in North Carolina that have hemlock woolly adelgid infestations. Um, I will be enclosing infested hemlock branches with the uh, mesh bags in the picture there. So the branches will be enclosed and there'll be treatments with and without uh, these two Lococa species. Um, and before enclosing the branches, you will get a, a count of the hemlock woolly adelgid ovisacs um, to see how many there are before we enclose them. And then we will, uh, and close them with the, the bags 
and collections will happen two, six, eight, and 12 weeks apart. And then uh, after they're collected, we will count to see how many ova sacs are, are left over. So, and we're hoping for a significant uh, reduction in the treatments with Lacopus species. Um, and hopefully that shows that uh, the copus species is an effective predator of hemlock willow delgid because this would inform next research steps and whether or not this is worth continuing research to release these uh, two species of silver fly from the Pacific Northwest as a biological control of hemlock willow delgid. Next slide. So just to summarize, uh, these two species of Lacopus, uh, Lacopus spinaparida and Lacopus argenticolis from the Pacific Northwest have great uh, potential as biological controls because they're predators of both generations. They can survive in the climate in the Eastern uh, North America, but we're still not sure what the impacts are if they're an effective enough predator of hemlock willow adelgid. And this is one of my research objectives is to find out if they are effective predators of hemlock willow adelgid. Next slide. Okay, so any questions? Awesome, thanks Liam. Questions, you can put them in the chat or unmute yourself or raise your hand. I have a question, so I guess I can go ahead. Great presentation, Liam. I always love to hear the updates on what's going on with HWA. So I'm curious Thanks if you me. know um, if there's any interaction between, any evidence of like competition or other interaction between these silver flies and the Laracobius beetles that had previously been released, if there's anything going on there? Yeah, so that was um, that was going to be part of my, uh, my research, but um, uh, COVID put a damper on that pretty quick. Um, but that's, uh, there's another um, PhD student, I think in Virginia Tech, that is going to try and do a study um, this coming spring, looking at that to see if there is any kind of competition between Laracobius and uh, the two species of silver fly. It's thought that there probably isn't due to the fact that Lar there, there's only a small amount of over overlap in their uh, life cycles. So Laracobius nigrinus um, is only present for a little while in the spring. Uh, and then it drops to the ground to estivate. Um, and that's, and then kind of right around that same time, that's when uh, the two species of silver fly are really uh, start to emerge. So, uh, but that's a, you know, that's definitely a, a question that needs to be answered. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. Bill? Yeah, I have one. Um, Liam, I thought that was a great talk. You're getting really good at this. <laughs> um, I have a question about something I don't think we've ever discussed before, which is what do we know about the potential impacts on non-target species, the potential for the silver fly to escape? Has there been any other research on that so far? Yeah, so um, the research that was done around seeing if these two species of silver fly are specialist predators found that they primarily eat adelgids. Um, so there's uh, white pine adelgid, which is found um, in Eastern North America. And the actually interesting thing about these two species of silver fly is there, there's also um, two species of Lacopus argenticolis and Lacopus pinnaparita found in Eastern North, uh, Eastern North America on the East Coast as well. Uh, but they seem to have uh, diverged a little bit. And the ones in the Pacific Northwest only go after hemlock willow adelgid, and the ones on the east coast seem to prefer uh, white pine adelgid. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, you know, there could be uh, an issue where uh, these ones from the Pacific Northwest could end up going after white pine adelgid. But um, I don't. I, they, they seem to, uh, in the research that was done, they uh, had a better chance of reproducing and surviving off of hemlock woolly adelgid. So I think they've kind of evolved with that uh, prey resource, so. Great, thanks. We might have time for one sh short question.
All right, well, um, we'll move ahead. So just a reminder, we're in session two. You can access session one by that link. Um, also a reminder that this is being recorded. I'll wait a minute um, until it's six to begin the next session. All right, I think we are there. So next we have Tessa McGann. She grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, and this winter she is looking forward to finding new spots to explore on ice skates. So fun. Her talk tonight is entitled Climate Change Perception and Adaptation Among Foresters in the Northeast. Tessa? Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, next slide. All right, climate change is happening. Um, you all are attending the Rubenstein Graduate Symposium, so I'm going to assume I don't need to convince you of that. Um, I will highlight, though, that it's happening in the Northeast, which we defined as New England and New York in the study. Um, and what we're seeing are rising temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, that's increased precipitation in more extreme events, um, rising sea level, and an increase in non-native pests, pathogens, and invasive plants. Next. Uh, not surprisingly, this is having an impact on our forests. Um, on the left, we see a distribution of the habitat that is currently suited to specific uh, combinations of tree species in the Northeast. That's a lot of that olive green, maple beech, birch forest, uh, the light blue spruce fir up in Maine and some oak communities throughout. And then on the right, we see a projection for just 80 years in the future. It's uh, based on a high emissions model, and it shows that our habitat will be far more suited for that dark green oak hickory forest that is, is currently well to our south. Um, the maple beech birch will be pushed to higher elevations and latitudes, and we see a loss of the spruce fir. Uh, you may be wondering, it's still forest. Why does it matter which trees are there? Um, but I would say that uh, our forests are so much more than just trees out there. Uh, the, the species that we have now are so tied to the ecological and cultural and economic well-being of our region. Um, what would the Abenaki basket makers do without black ash? And what would it mean for sugar bushes and really the identity of a lot of New Englanders if we lost sugar maple? So I, we have to look at these changes and plan for these changes. Otherwise, we have a lot stand to lose a lot more than just specific tree species. Uh, next slide. For example, this combination of the rate of change and the compounding stresses, we stand to lose forest wholesale. Um, on the top right, we see a forest that's lost to rising waters. Below that, some invasive species, kudzu hell. And then on the left, we have a forest in Rhode Island that failed to grow back to regenerate after a harvest due to compounding stresses of drought and deer herbivory and forest pests. Next slide. Um, now that I've sufficiently scared you with those dramatic photos, I'll say that there are things we can do uh, to help the forest adapt to these changes. And I'm using, in the study, I'm using the IPCC definition of adaptation. It's adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or their effects which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. And I just wanted to give you some examples of what that looks like in forestry for you to have in mind for the rest of this talk. So it can be things like treating ash trees um, to help them resist this wave of EAB. It can look like thinning the forest to promote individual tree vigor and optimal forest structure to help them be more resilient in the face of these extreme storms and winds. Or it can be things like planting those southern adapted species um, to help the forest transition to the future climate. So great, we know what to do. The question is, are we doing it? And as these actions are largely in the hands of foresters, folks around the world have been asking, are foresters doing it? Are foresters adapting? Next slide. And really, why are they adapting or why not? With the hope of finding ways that we can support their adaptation and encourage adaptation. And so in the literature, social scientists, um, largely from Western Europe and the Western United States have, have identified some major factors that go into whether or not foresters are adapting. Um, first, if they believe in anthropogenic climate change, they're a lot more likely to do something about it. Um, second, if they know what to do to adapt, if they have the information that they want and the information that we want them to have, um, they're more likely to use it. <laughs> Three, uh, if they perceive that the risk of doing nothing is greater than the risk of doing something new or investing resources up front, um, 
they're more likely to adapt. And then finally, there's this question of um, the resources that they have and whether or not they, they perceive these barriers, big technical barriers, economic barriers, um, social and institutional barriers. Um, next slide. So how do these factors, how are they showing up in the Northeast? Um, well, there have been a, three surveys in this region in the last decade, and they found that largely foresters are willing to adapt, and there's widespread acceptance of anthropogenic climate change. Woo. Um, but there are big barriers, one in the form of uncertainty, which is a term that's broadly used in this literature, but um, encompasses things like being unsure of what to do and where to do it. Um, and what to prioritize. And then there are those technical barriers, which really are economic, um, lack of funding, um, poor markets, and then lack of willingness on the part of landowners who have a large say in these decisions. Uh, next slide. So we have this data, why this study, why my study? I am asking very similar questions, uh, but there are some key differences. First, the literature that I've mentioned in this area is survey-based and quantitative, and I'm planning to, I am doing qualitative analysis of in-depth interviews. Um, the idea there being that letting foresters speak for themselves, we're hoping to get more nuance and, and depth and use that to shed light on these ideas of risk and uncertainty. Um, two, a lot of the literature to debate to date has overlooked urban forestry, um, but we know that urban forests are so important in mitigating the impacts of climate change, and so that especially in the northeast, and so that's a major component of this project. And then finally, this research is part of a bigger project that aims to to close the gap between what adaptation researchers are looking at and what practitioners are doing on the ground. So my interviews have informed surveys that have gone out to get more feedback from urban and rural foresters. Um, and the intention is to use all of this to inform experiments, uh, to actually answer the questions that practitioners are asking. Next slide. All right, what have I done? I've interviewed 32 foresters across the region in the last year. 17 rural foresters, which we've defined as people who are making decisions for um, civil cultural decisions for forested land in rural areas. And then 15 urban foresters, which is a harder term to define. Uh, it's a relatively newer field and looks really different city to city. Um, but we were trying to talk to, I was ta trying to talk to people who are making management decisions for naturally forested areas in urban spaces. So places like Centennial Woods and Ethan Allen Park. Um, on the right, you can see the breakdown of who I talked to by state and, uh, and land ownership in this area. So I asked 18 over and open-ended questions. We usually chatted for about an hour and a half. The interviews were recorded and transcribed. And now Rachel Schottman, the principal investigator on this work over at UMaine, and I are reading through these interviews and coding them with software called InVivo, which means uh, uh, finding the themes that are emerging from the text uh, based on the questions that we have, and then tagging the text with, the, with representative themes for further analysis. Next slide. We are just over halfway through with the coding and at the beginning of analysis, but I'll share what we've been seeing. First of all, foresters are adapting, um, but they're largely using those resistance and resilience strategies, and many of which are things that have been around for a while. Um, for example, the increasing diversity, species and structural diversity in the forest, like that has been a part of best management practices and foresters are pretty comfortable with that stuff. It's um, these transition strategies, the, the poster child of which is assisted migration, that planting of more Southern species, those are newer and riskier. And we've noticed that the people who are using them and leaning into them are people who've experienced greater loss at the hand of these environmental changes, especially um, invasive pests, which is coming up so much in this session. Um, so all of that to say is we plan to look a lot more at the connection between experiences and risk perception and the different strategies foresters are utilizing. Um, while they are adapting, they're still facing major barriers. And a lot of this echoes what they're finding in the surveys today. Um, economics is huge, lack of funding and poor markets is tough when a lot of these adaptation strategies require upfront investments. Oh, I think I froze. I'm back. OK, um, another big thing is public opinion in the Northeast right now. There's a there's a growing movement to stop the cutting of all trees because they're seen as so important to fighting climate change. But that includes the cutting of trees, which can help improve the health of forests um, in response to climate change. And this is a 
very large concern for a lot of the foresters that I talk to. And then finally, there's that beast of uncertainty again. Next slide. Uh, we are trying to address that uncertainty by looking, asking foresters for what their specific questions are. And I thought it was interesting to compare that across urban and rural communities. So on the urban side, um, a big thing that comes up is how will all these in stressors intersect the changing temperature and precipitation with uh, with pests and with deer? And how will that happen on the small scale? They want they want to know. What will be what to think about and what to look at when making decisions on the scale that they work at, so at site level and stand level. Um, I get a lot of questions about carbon storage and sequestration. It's unclear to a lot of people what the best management practices are to increase that. Um, and then finally, how to best monitor. Foresters want to know how can they trust what they're seeing and and what should they be looking at and looking for. Um, on the urban side, the the biggest question that I get again and again is what should we plant? Um, planting is sort of the name of the game in urban forestry, even, even in a lot of the naturally forested areas. Um, but they get hit hard by these invasive pests and see that their palette of choices is, is dwindling in many ways. So that's a big concern. Um, another thing is that because they're planting a lot, I've noticed urban foresters are more likely to be planting southern species. Um, but there's this question of how much should they be doing it? How much should they be leaning into that? One forester framed it, does it make sense to hit fast forward? Um, and then again, this question of how to best monitor. I was also looking at what these communities can learn from each other. Um, on the rural side, that issue of public perception comes up a lot. And for urban foresters, working with the public and getting them on board with things and telling them their story, that's so much a part of their work and they name that as a part of their work. And I think that rural foresters can learn a lot about how to prioritize that impact, that, that aspect and do it well. Um, and then on the rural side, I mean, on the urban side, I've noticed that there's a sense of isolation among a lot of practitioners. Um, I think because it's a newer field, it's a little bit scattered and, and a lot of people feel like they have to write the book on how to adapt in their region. Um, Whereas among urban forest, I mean, among rural foresters, they say that they learn a lot from their communities of practice and professional organizations. And um, I think urban practitioners would benefit from similar resources. Oh gosh, I'm out of running out of time. Next slide. <laughs> so the big takeaway, how can we support them? We as researchers and scientists first answer their questions, these questions that they're telling me. Um, but but more importantly, stay in conversation with foresters. A lot of people I talked to said that the personal connections with researchers, having a person to turn to when they have a question is so important. Um, two, providing those tools for better storytelling among foresters and then telling better stories ourselves and making sure that we're telling the stories to the broader community too. And then finally, as a, for the future of my work is identifying, identifying those risky and uncertain elements and determining what can we make more clear and more certain. And in situations where we can't, where it's just inherently uncertain, how can we provide uh, no regrets strategies for those foresters? All right, next slide. My references and next slide. I just want to say thank you so much. Thanks to my advisors, Rachel Schottman and Tony D'Amato, the man with the lunchbox. Thanks, Todd, Jess Weichel, and everyone who's helped me and all of you for listening. Thanks, Tessa. Your enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Bill, is your hand up or is that from last time? It is not up. I'm sorry about okay. that. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> All right, questions? <laughs> Hey, Tessa, I just want to jump in and say that was a great um, presentation. Um, I just had a quick question about when you were uh, working with some of these foresters, you had any, you came across any barriers in terms of um, asking them these questions about what they are, what they're doing to sort of uh, kind of adapt with climate change. I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone felt, you know, sensitive or sort of guarded about what is going on and I just would love to hear any sort of 
insights about your uh, experiences, you know, interviewing these folks? That's a really That's interesting really question. question. And I, I'd say no, that I don't think anyone felt too cagey about what they were doing. Um, and I think part of it, I didn't, my interview guide was structured such that I didn't specifically name climate change coming into it, just was generally asking about environmental changes that they're observing and, and what they're doing in response to that. Um, and people were pretty open to talking about that. Um, I think I had a couple questions about about risk specifically, especially if they thought um, other people's practices were risky ever. And I think that was the most one, the one that I got the most pushback on because um, they didn't want to feel like they were gossiping. So <laughs> just uh, putting that out there, foresters are on the whole um, respect each other and, and aren't, aren't down to spill the tea. Thanks, Tessa. Yeah, thank you. All right, so just a reminder again that we are recording. This is session two. You can follow the link to session one. So we will move on to our last uh, talk of the evening. So next we have Jess Weichel. She is from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and she is looking forward to uh, spending lots of time cross-country skiing this winter. Her talk tonight is entitled Structural and Compositional Outcomes of Adaptive Forest Management in Two Forest Types. Take Great. it away, Jess. Thanks, Eva. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about some of my research focused on outcomes of adaptive forest management tonight. Next slide. So there are a number of forest health concerns these days, many of them centered on climate change. One of the big ones is drought. Um, drought is a big concern across the US um, for, for one reason, as we saw this summer, it has the potential to increase wildfire severity. Uh, but that aside, it also puts stress on trees, slows down forest productivity, and can potentially lead to large areas of tree mortality. Uh, warmer temperatures are also a concern with climate change. Warm summer temperatures can exacerbate drought conditions and shifts in spring and fall seasonality temperatures can make forests more vulnerable to storm damage and can potentially cause mismatches in pollinators in the long term. Related to this, as we've talked about with a few other presenters tonight, and those of you who are here earlier saw this map once already, forest pests are a big concern. Uh, especially in the eastern U.S., invasive insects and fungi have the ability to kill individual tree species and kill trees across a broad range. And coupled with this are invasive plant species, which can greatly limit forest regeneration um, and can also disrupt native understory plant communities and forests. Next slide. Coupled with this um, is a human-caused uh, creation of more forest vulnerability related to colonial land use and abandonment. Um, so as Europeans colonized the eastern U.S., a lot of land was cleared for agriculture and then subsequently abandoned all around the same time as people moved west. Forests grew back up after this, and as a result, there are a lot of even-aged forests across the eastern U.S., uh, and at this point now that we're 100 plus years past that, um, there aren't a lot of patches of young forests. I'm alongside this, uh, between the farm abandonment and logging, there also are fewer big older trees. So forests tend to be more uniform, uniform in age class as well as species composition. And also fire, both natural fire and fire as a management tool by indigenous people has largely dropped off as a management tool, um, creating less structural variability. Next slide. So, so these two concerns bring about the broad question of how, how can managers, forest managers shift approaches to better help forests adapt to these threats? Next. Um, and a suggested framework has been put forward to try to answer this question uh, based on a gradient of forest change and adaptation. Um, so starting from the bottom left, a resistance approach is based on a forest's ability to absorb disturbance and maintain relatively unchanged conditions and forest health. Uh, resilience is designed to accommodate some change, but retain an ability to return to a prior condition. Whereas a transition management approach is designed to facilitate change and encourage systems to respond to new conditions. Next. 
So from a more specific management approach, again, working from the bottom up, a resistance approach would work to maintain current species composition and structure in a forest. A resilience approach would likely increase species diversity and structural arrangement, while a transition approach would encourage a department from current dominant species and forest structure. Next slide. And I'll be looking at this framework in two forest types, uh, pine forest in Minnesota and uh, northern hardwood forest in New Hampshire. I'll go into a little bit more detail on these, but broadly the differences between them include dominant tree species, climactic conditions, as well as disturbance and management history. Next. The pine forest in Minnesota is has red pine as the dominant component with a couple other conifer species as well as a few hardwood species present. These forests evolved with a mixed severity fire regime, so ranging from low intensity ground fires up to fires hot enough to, to kill the forest canopy, but fire is no longer a management tool on the landscape. Um, the dominant tree species are pretty shade intolerant and grow best in the sun. Further complicating things are that the forest is near the prairie forest ecotone, uh, which means it's near the, the location in the U.S. where conditions are too dry for forests to persist and grasslands take over. Uh, so securing regeneration in these forests is generally a concern. And some major climate change worries here are increased drought and subsequent vulnerability to wildfire and forest pests. Next. The northern hardwood forest in Vermont is a broadleaf dominated forest with sugar maple, the most common species, as well as large components of yellow birch and beech. Unlike the red pine forest, it evolved primarily with small scale gap storm related disturbances, which means that fairly continuous canopy cover was maintained and shade tolerant species tended to dominate. So major climate con change concerns here are seasonal drought, increased vulnerability to wind and ice storms and facilitation of forest pests. Next. Uh, coming back to the two sites together, despite all of these differences, a common theme between the two is that diversity and elements of forest structure will drive their ability to adapt to climate change or other disturbances. Next slide. And what I mean by forest structure is elements such as trees and woody material found in the forest and also the spatial arrangement of these elements. Next slide. And a lot of research exists uh, about the benefits of structural complexity in forests, uh, but most simply, complex forests have a variety of disturbance recovery pathways. And what I mean by this is that a forest that has a number of different species and a number of different structural elements, in the case of a large disturbance, will likely have some components that are able to make it through and ultimately make sure that a forest and a functioning ecosystem persist. Next slide. So the broad objective of my research is to quantify the structural and compositional outcomes of the adaptive management framework in two distinct forest types. Next slide. And I'll just talk briefly about the methods. Uh, the resistance, resilience, and transition treatments were replicated at both sites, as well as an uncut control. And a network of plots was put in to, to measure forest structure. This included forest overstory, a forest understory and regeneration, as well as shrub and herbaceous layers. And uh, measurements exist both from before treatment and several years after treatment. The Minnesota site was treated in 2015 and the New Hampshire site in 2017. Next slide. And I'll move into some of the results. Um, these are diameter distributions to so show how many trees are in each size class across each site. And we'll look at uh, the red pine site in Minnesota on the left first. And the first thing I'll point out is that the uncut control or the blue line has a lot more trees in small size classes than any of the treatments do. This is a result of selection for retaining large vigorous healthy trees and removing smaller less vigorous trees around them to give them more access to water and sunlight. The other notable thing here is that the yellow and black or the resilience and resistance both have pretty similar diameter distributions. What this figure doesn't show is spatial arrangement of the stands. 
So the resistance site was treated pretty uniformly across all of the land, uh, whereas the resilience site had canopy gaps installed, uncut reserves retained, and the remainder of the forest in between thinned. So while this view shows us a similar distribution of tree sizes, at a landscape scale, things look pretty different. Moving into New Hampshire, we can see that the forest overstory structure is pretty different to start with. There are lots more smaller trees, largely due to the fact that there are so many shade tolerant trees there and trees that thrive in the shade. So there are a lot of mid-story and understory trees as well as larger trees. Also, the differences between the treatments look a lot smaller here. A lot of that has to do with the size variation and diversity in the site. Um, whereas the uncut control on the pine site has kind of a uniformity of trees across the smaller diameter classes, um, this site has a lot, a lot more variation, which means that it'll take time and potentially another treatment for the overstory conditions to start to look different. And finally, with both of them, um, part of the change in stand structure is it will eventually be filled in by the regenerating forest, which obviously isn't a part of it yet. Uh, next slide. And then here we're just looking at species composition. So this is the amount of change of, of dominance and overstory species from pre-harvest to post-harvest. Um, so the first thing I'll point out is at both sites, the uncut control shows some change. This is partly due to natural measurement error and partially due to things like natural mortality. Uh, but because of that, I'll just point out the biggest changes at each site. So in the Minnesota pine site, um, if you remember back to the earlier slides, the transition site is designed to eventually change overstory species dominance. So red pine is the most common species. And with this treatment, red pine decreased slightly in importance um, as did fir, which is a less climate adapted species. Um, white pine increased in importance, which was one of the goals. Another goal was to diversify overstory in general, and that very small gray bar of other indicates that perhaps the sand is moving in that direction. Um, moving over to the New Hampshire site on the right, the area with the biggest change in species composition is resistance. And again, if you can remember back to the earlier slide, uh, the goal of resistance is to retain current species composition and structure. So you might wonder why there's such a big change there. And the reason is that the resistance is also designed to absorb disturbance, which means that any management would retain the healthiest and most vigorous individuals. Uh, beech trees are vulnerable to a pest called beech bark disease, which damages their vascular systems and kills them very, very slowly. So when the forest managers came through this site, they removed a lot of the unhealthy and less vigorous trees, uh, which did have the effect of slightly changing species composition. Conversely, many of the sugar maples, the dominant species that were there were quite healthy. Um, so they changed in importance a little bit. Um, and again, the other thing I'll point out in New Hampshire is that on the y-axis, we can see the changes here are very small. Um, most of these changes aren't statistically, statistically significant, uh, but are just worth looking at. Um, and again, the reason the changes in the New Hampshire site are so small has a lot to do with how diverse and dense the stands are. Um, and again, a lot of the composition goals will be achieved um, over the long time scale of a forest life by the ultimate regeneration coming up in the forest. Next. Um, so to wrap it up, um, pretreatment diversity influences changes in forest structure. And that's something I'll have to take into account as I look at these two sites in the future. Um, a lot of the changes brought on by these adaptive treatments will take a long time to manifest due to the slow growth of forests. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with climate change continuing to happen. And finally, my next steps are to look at these stands from a more spatial, spatially explicit standpoint um, to, to better understand forest complexity across the stand scale. Next slide. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone who's helped me out so far. Um, there have been many, many field techs at both sites over the past five or six years, gathering data, um, a lot of funding sources, and a lot of collaborators that have made this project come together. Next.
Um, so thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Jess. Any questions? Yes, I'll ask one. Go for it. <laughs> Since no one else has. I thought that was a great talk and really interesting. Um, super interested by your work. I, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this question, but do you think that these <clears throat> classifications of species into, and I, I think I got that part of your talk right, into resistance or resilience when you were plotting the diameter distributions, right? That was basically species classified into those groups resistance, resilience, and transitions? No? Um, the diameter distributions were all trees across the stand. Um, so those are the different treatments? The, the, yeah, four different treatments. Ah, uh, aha. Well, all. actually, okay, so that clarifies my question, and I can stop right there. That that, that makes total sense. Sure. I, I mean, I was going to, if you're interested, I was going to ask you whether you think <clears throat> some of our notions about resistance and resilience traits, you know, the whole idea of like plant functional trait diversity and how those confer resilience to, to climate change and those sorts of things, whether those might be kind of dynamic constructs, you know, so like traits and even structural conditions that we think of as being resistant or resilient now might not be or might behave totally different under a future climate. That's a really, that's a really good question. Um, I, yeah, I do think so. I mean, I think that we're kind of jumping into this with a lot of like hedging our bets and guessing at what we think might be the best thing. And um, I am planning on like doing some functional trade analysis with both of these sites also. So I hope to maybe have a better sense of some of that in the future. But in general, yeah, I mean, this, this approach like seems to have a, a good background and a good foundation to stand on. But I also think that we really don't know what to expect at all. Um, so yeah, I think I think understanding some of the dynamics and some of the things about species composition is important and being able to measure and quantify it is probably important for understanding, but I think that we're pretty far from saying like, yes, the transition treatment is the best thing for climate adaptation or something like that. Um, yeah, it would be, yeah, it would be interesting to think of these as kind of dynamic, like moving targets somehow. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jess. And thanks to all the speakers um, who presented tonight and all the guests for spending part of their Friday night with us. It's been super exciting to hear about all the research that's been going on. I'm always super impressed by my Rubenstein peers and super grateful to be a part of this academic and personal community. I hope that everyone has a great weekend. I hope that everyone finds a way to take care of themselves during this unsettling time. So yeah, thank stay you safe. Your, thank yeah. you for your work on this, everyone. Uh, thank you for your for all your uh, facilitation, everybody, and for the great presentations. I have loved it. Yeah, if you want to unmute yourself and say thank you to the presenters, feel free to do so. <clears throat> Thanks everyone. Thank good job, Eva, uh, facilitating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Everybody Eva. Back. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. I'm going to go to the other room. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Well done.